a little bit early and just, you know, make it fun. I see a lot of people are here, Aunt Cindy Skinks and Blast Cat, the Beetle Guy, All Exotics, Don Gallagher, Wendy Hickson, Dope Critters, Frank the Tank, What else is in here? 503. I'm just kind of going through the chat. I think I already said the beetle guy. Yep, random T. Did I say that? I don't know. Magnificent animals. Got quite a few people here. So that's great. We've got 10 people and 11 likes. That's pretty pretty nice ratio there. Um, I can see that Chris the Mad Aquarist is here too. Biggs is here. Excellent. Glad to see you here. Um, I've had better days, but I think uh, it's about to take a, a sharp turn for the better now that I'm here with y'all on a live stream. So GX Cat is here. Tobias. Desiree. Laura Taylor. Christine. Champara. I think I said Blast Cat already. Um, welcome all. Therapod Hunter. Oh, sorry. I'm Trying to open this so you can see what's going on. Got a basking uh, melanistic garter right here, but there are a bunch of them zipping around there. There are five snakes in this enclosure. Uh, one of them is a young red sided garter, and the rest are melanistic eastern garters. And uh, they're all too young to breed, so I'm not concerned about having them in the same enclosure for the moment. Uh, not for a few more months. I don't need to worry about it. There's another one right there. They all shed fairly recently, had a meal a couple of days ago, so they're doing really well. And now they're demonstrating their usual inquisitive nature, which is awesome. And they're getting big. So Tobias, oh, congrats on your first babies. That's fantastic. And there's Mark Hartley. First time on the chat. Awesome. Glad to hear that you've been learning a lot about isopods and millipedes from the channel. That's fantastic. So Desiree, yeah, um, snakes are fantastic pets. I wish your husband would realize that as well. And garter snakes are totally underrated. There's Mantis God. <laughs> 503. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good method. Look, we've got all four of them right here on their basking spot. They're wondering what's going on. They're wondering if I'm going to give them a meal, I think, is what's going on there. They're pretty uh, excited about that possibility. So 503, better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Sometimes that's true. With snakes, maybe it is. And, oh, thank you, the beetle guy, with the congratulations on the... 60k. I'm excited about it too. They really have. They've grown. They've grown quite a bit. They were like very, very tiny when I got them in June. They were about one and a half to two months old at the time because they were born in April, and they have just they've been putting on a lot of size. And thank you, Chris. The charcoal noodles. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I like it. Um, so Therapod Hunter is watching the video on infusoria culture. You have new tadpoles. Awesome. I hope those do really well for you. Do you have some Daphne or something like that to give them as well? And thank you, 503. Appreciate that. It has been a fun journey. An interesting ride. Look at these, these garter snakes climbing up in the branches. Love it. Um, there's chain as well. Slithery salutations. That's hard to beat. There's the slithery salutations are definitely in order. The chocolate pocky stick is alive. Uh. Oh, well, thank you, Chris. The Mad Aquarist Biggs or Biggs, as people often call you. I appreciate that. That's uh. 
that makes me feel good. I hope, I hope, uh, I hope that's true that I can, uh, that I can be an inspiration to some people that then I, I'm, I'm happy if that's what's happening. That's awesome. Oh, so therapy hunter, you, they're too small to eat adult Daphne, huh? Right now. This is what I love too. Garter snakes climb all over your hands. They love it. They, there's certainly some suspicion that they're looking for food, but also they'll do this even when they're not hungry. Oh, reptilia exotics. That's a lot of, that's what happens. You go to get three or four, you get 13. Yeah. I was just going to get a few for my uh, bioactive setups when I started out. You know how that goes. Um, and, oh, living black licorice. I like that. So Tobias, the Patreon does not include a Discord group link. I haven't delved into Discord. I thought about it. But I thought, you know, maybe if I can get some people to commit to be um, mods on there, I probably wouldn't be on there much. But if, if we could get some people to do that, I might do it. Oh, Christine, congratulations on the new frogs. That's awesome. Uh oh, how are we doing on the sound? Sound. Ah. Uh, okay. Are we back? Sounds back. I'm not sure what happened there. Hopefully, I have to keep an eye on my batteries. Um, not sure what was going on there. <laughs> I really don't know. Uh, hopefully, my batteries are not in my in my wireless mic are not dying. So, not sure what was going on there. <laughs> well, I think that's enough with the uh, melanistic garters. Um, I just, I could sit and watch them for hours and just do a, a melanistic garter stream, but I don't think that's what everybody's here for. So I'm going to, going to move back a little bit. We're going to move on to something else. Let me scoot back here, shut down, shut the door and we'll move over. Okay. Just a second here. It's going to be messy for a second. As I jiggle everything around and move everything, look at different enclosures. Hold on. I'm going to change some altitude for a second. Ooh, sorry. That's just the way that works. See if I can do some maneuvering. There we go. Cool.
Hold on, everybody. How's the sound? I think I know what's going on. I think my batteries are just low on my microphone, and I need to plug it in. So, um, I'll just leave that be for now and see what happens. Sorry about the, the technical difficulty. So, this enclosure, I just want you to kind of tell me what you think about it. This enclosure is uh, tarantula cribs. Uh, I think it's the, is it the medium arboreal enclosure or something. This is for my um, Phidippus ardens, a desert species of Phidippus jumping spider. And I'm just kind of putting this together. I've got some choya. I'm going to put another piece of choya in, maybe something like that. Kind of minimalistic, but give the, the spider some interesting things to do and some things to grab onto, um, stuff like that. So what do you think? Let's see, Therapod Hunter, have you ever had Porcelio in Canis? I have not. Sounds like an interesting one, a violet morph. I didn't even know that was a thing. So, Beetle Guy, do you still keep saltwater aquaria or dart frogs? I don't have any saltwater aquaria. I do have brackish aquaria right now, and I do have dart frogs. I have my trio of bumblebees that I've had for years now. I don't know exactly how long. I should go back and find out. And Wanderlust Farm, it sure is cold in Utah. The other day when I got up, uh, I left the house to go to work. It was, no joke, zero degrees Fahrenheit. And I know that some of you are from places like Michigan and you think zero degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, that's a nice warm winter day. But um, for us here in Utah, zero degrees Fahrenheit is pretty cold. And with the wind chill, it was even worse. And so, uh, yeah, cold day. There's Looch. Hey, good to see you. And the tarantula cribs, uh, they're, they're a little bit more expensive than some other things, but they are awesome, and they're, they're quality enclosures. I love them. Yeah, I'm thinking of doing some magnetic ledges in here, for sure. I think that would be good. Um, I'm trying to decide exactly what I want to do with that. I do have some neodymium magnets, um, some of them right here, and I want to make some magnetic ledges. I'm just trying to decide what to do that will fit the theme if I want some sandstone ledges or what. I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it up um, here, and I want to show you the little guy. This is the Phidippus Ardens right here. This enclosure, by the way, is from bigfatfids.com. Big Fat Fids is local to me and um, just gave me this enclosure, which I think is awesome. It's, it's bottom opening, which is nice. And it's got these really good uh, vents for plenty of air movement across and top. Well, it's not exactly across because there's only one vent on the side, but between the top and the side, you get good ventilation going on. I just barely moved this guy, kind of a um, rehousing, moving him up um, from the smaller enclosure that he came in. And I'm gonna put some more decor in here, but it was just time to move him over and uh, get him fed and everything. He's a beautiful one if you haven't seen, I don't know if you can see the beautiful red and black colors on there through the webbing of his little hammock. It's gorgeous. I'm gonna try to feed him this moth. I have a pyralis moth I just put in there. And We'll see if that works. I don't think it's going to work on camera necessarily uh, for you to see the, the feeding, but who knows? It's a little bit hard to do with an enclosure like this. I don't think that's going to, going to fly, but he's a beautiful little spider and I'm excited about that. Now we're going to move to some isopods. So give me a second as I move the camera once again. Uh, it was Take some adjustment, but uh, I wanted to hit some Patreon questions. And uh, one of them related to isopods. Uh, well, a couple of them did. And we're going to take a look at these specific isopods as part of the answer to that question. So here we go. We'll start exploring here. See what we can see.
So, Abriel, I think keeping Zoophobus Atratus with a subadult Pac-Man frog, they would just get eaten um, by the Pac-Man frog pretty quickly. That's my guess. And Christine, there is a, there are a lot of spiny species of ice pods these days, so I'm not sure which one, but there are many. I have one that's slightly spiky, more like bumpy than spiky, to be honest, but it's considered a spiky ice pod. It's a Christarmidlidium muricatum. Okay, we're going to move over here. And this question, I'm, I'm going to pull open the uh, Patreon questions to make sure I get it all right. Uh, where are we here? Right here? This question is from Droth, and the question is, any updates on the Pied Armadillidium vulgare? I made a video not super long ago about these guys. Um, they're really cool. You've got a lot of variations. Some look just like wild types, but you can see there's some really interesting Pied specimens in here, if I can keep the focus on them. But there is an update, and the update is we're getting offspring. You can see some young individuals in the substrate and on this piece of cork bark and stuff and the uh, jury is still out on whether any of these young are going to be pied like uh, many of these adults are not sure about that yet but we will see at least they're producing offspring there are a lot of offspring down in the substrate and whatnot so that is my update that they are doing well producing offspring but I'm not sure about uh, whether their offspring are showing up pied or not. This is not a first generation thing. I think these are third generation. So Oh, some people are talking about dwarf tarantulas. Awesome. Okay. Now, I love the Serial Cosmos elegans. They look so, so beautiful. Okay. So, of course, just about any tarantula is beautiful. I, it's hard to think of one that's not. Okay. So, this enclosure here, we're going to talk about substrate a little bit because we have a question about substrate. As we check out these guys, this is um, an enclosure that has a mostly isolated population of Oreo crumbles. This is the, these are the individuals I produced myself. So you can see there's a bunch of Oreo crumbles in here. Um, there are a few that are just orange, and I'm still culling those out and putting them in my party mix um, so that I have just pure um, orange crumbles. But most of them are orange crumbles, and these are all orange crumbles I produced myself by crossing Oreo crumbles with oranges and then you know starting to isolate these out in the third generation as opposed to, well there's the cross and then there's the F1s and then it's the F2s that I that I isolated out and then these are mostly descendants of F2s but like you see there is occasional orange one there might be an occasional lead type whatnot in here but um, Kind of how it works. So I was going to feed these. This is um, some food that um, Joe from Jam's Jungle Pods um, sent me. Some ice pod food that he produces. To try out along with some springtail food. I think I showed that in a in a recent video. But I wanted to see, since these uh, Porcelionidae have a really good feeding response, if we could get them eating on camera, maybe, huh? Just getting the container open here. I'm gonna put some in a little feeding dish over in the corner there. Let's see what we can get. We get a feeding response. Um, I also have another bin. This is my party mix one or one of my party.
already mixed bins, um, just in the display enclosure. I'm going to try putting some there too because I figured they will like these. If they're, if anybody's going to react, it's going to be the Porcelio Levis and these guys in terms of speed of reaction. Okay. We'll just keep our eyes on those a little bit. Maybe come back to them in a few minutes. I'm going to kind of set them in the, the background and see what we see uh, as we look at some other stuff. Well, um, that's a good question, um, Joe Thero 925 kind of isopod that won't eat eggs that are laid in the substrate. Um, I don't know if I can say that there's a one that absolutely never will eat eggs that are in the substrate. Um, I would say you have some, some options, some might be less likely to eat them than others. I know that our uh, crested gecko, here, I'm going to try to move these out of the way, see what we do. Because I'm going to come back to those and look at them from the side and I can show you some other things. In the meantime, right here on the shelf. Okay, I'll take a look. I'm moving some things around a little bit. What have we got here? Um, I would say in, in my crested gecko enclosure, I've had eggs hatch in there um, with dwarf whites in there. And that's not to say that they will not eat eggs because they can and they do sometimes. But if there are plenty of other nutrients, at least some of the eggs survive because I'm not even trying to breed crested geckos. Um, these are just parthenogenic eggs that hatch, and I've had three of them hatch successfully in a bioactive enclosure with dwarf whites. This is Armadillidium klugai dubrovnik, and this is a strain that produces some uh, high red individuals. So that's what we're looking at here. I think um, these look these look pretty good when they're in nice light. I don't know if you can see the springtails going absolutely nuts over here on the remnants of the food. Oh, 503, that's awesome. <laughs> Baby emerald tree skink dropped off the ceiling and landed on her. That's awesome. Well, my uh, Dubrovniks are doing okay. They, uh, I had a die off early on and, and then got some more and they produced a ton of babies. And now most of the ones you see are some of those babies. I don't know exactly how many are in this bin. It's not exactly overrun with Dubrovniks, but it's not doing badly either. It's, it's doing okay. Um, now, look at this. Is this the one? No, this is what I was going to show you. The, uh, whoop, having some balance issues here with the camera. But you can see the party mix starting to uh, join the party over here, which is nice. Let's see. I wanted to share some isopods with you that were uh, a little different today. Let's see, what, which isopods have I not shared for a while? So this is a, uh, this is a Jam's Chow, stuff they're eating right now, Jam's Chow. Joe of Jam's Jungle Pods sent it to me to try it out, so giving it a go. And I think so far, it seems to be a success with these little guys. And Frank, how, it says secret ingredients on there. How did you figure that out, that that was actually waffles ground up? Focus is a little weird, but... 
you can see they're going to town. So Gecko Man 11, my room varies from 19 to 23 degrees daily. Is that too much for ice pods? Um, that's Celsius, I'm sure, and I think uh, that would be okay for some isopods. Uh, probably most, in fact, it would not necessarily be great for some of the tropical ones, but... So you know you're going to get uh, a pretty good feeding response from Porcelionides prunosus, generally, if you have enough of them. And this is a, even a fairly small bin. It's more of a display bin than a grow-out bin or anything. They do well in there. Let's take a peek down here. What do we got? What do we got? These are Shirutsuri. And they are definitely breeding uh, quite a bit since the last time I looked in here. There are more babies than last time. Hmm, yeah, look at that. Got a pretty decent density. It's a small container from a for a smaller, fairly new culture. That piece doesn't really have any on it. It's on the drier side, but yeah, Shiro Utsuri doing well. Tobias, what would, isopods would you recommend for a tiger salamander bioactive enclosure? Well, you're probably going to have to have something either that burrows a lot um, or reproduces a lot or is too small for them to be interested in eating, or both, or all three, rather. So that's interesting. I would say um, you could you could go with dwarf whites. You could go with something like Silisticus convexus, which burrows quite a bit, or Horsilio dilatatus, or something just super prolific like a dairy cows. You could try that. They would eat some of them. They would eat a lot, a lot of them. Um, so theropod hunter. Um, this is probably a dev question. Can the color of food affect isopod melanin? Good question. Um, food can uh, affect the appearance of isopods, and I'll give you an illustration of that shortly. I just wanted to see how these bodium are doing. I noticed the other day in this enclosure with the um, Casteldaccia or the bodium that uh, we've got babies in here, which is great. Let's see if we can see any babies in this enclosure. It's a fairly new enclosure, only had it a couple months, and was noticing babies in there the other day. There's a baby right there. Mixed in with the uh, springtails, but it's definitely an isopod baby. It's definitely a bodium or custodacha. Here's some colors on these are just phenomenal. Really love these. Yeah, Heather Jensen was just mentioning how you can feed carrots to white ice pods and turn them orange. Um, it can happen. So, let me, hmm. and Jonah, um, yeah, Jonah, you are, you could totally convert one of your tanks to a full isopod tank. I, I'm assuming you're considering terrestrial isopods here. Let me um, show you these guys while I go grab some other stuff. Oh, they're, they're going after that isopod food. Check them out. Focus is a little off, but it's not too bad. Um, you could. Some considerations. Make sure that they they can sometimes climb silicone. Uh, but if you make some accommodations, you can probably uh, make it work. So, chain. Yeah, I give uh, some of my crustaceans, not my isopods specifically, but some of my crustaceans, Give them astaxanthin, and they are doing, uh, you know, they do really well with the astaxanthin. Let's see. So, Aunt Cindy Skinks is wondering how many types I have. I have a little bit over 80 types, and a lot of those are not necessarily species level differences. They are morphs, they are localities, and so on, but 80-something at the time, and I most recently counted, and that was recently enough that I don't think I've had 
much in the way of acquisitions since then. Um, I had 80 something, 83, somewhere in there. Okay, well, we're going to take a look at these. These are one of my favorite smaller species, the marbleized. You know, I wonder when I look at these, it seems like some of them have much darker coloration than others. And I wonder if there are some that are hypomelanistic or whatever one's crawling on my finger. I'm going to put it down. But this, this species seems to do really well, stay small, have a really, really unique look to them. And it's just like they're all over the bottom of the, the bark here. And that's why I line up this bark like this, because they really seem to like it. I like that. It's, seems to be their favorite way to congregate. Cool little guys. So, um, Diotaro, um, 925, are the melanistic garters the same species as the red-sided garters? Same species, yes, same subspecies, no. So, my red-sideds are Thamnophis sertalis parietalis, as opposed to Infernalis. So, Infernalis is the California red-sided garters. And the melanistic easterns are um, Thamnophis sertalis sertalis. And there's Karsten Jensen. Welcome. Okay, let's let's move and look at something else, shall we? I'm gonna put these guys right in the limelight. We can watch them eat for a second while I go get somebody else. Okay, now this species is pretty impressive in terms of density. This is Peracai, also known as the alloy isopod. Perhaps looking at the tones of the exoskeletons of these critters, you can, you can see why. So these are Peracai. And Northwest Morph, thanks for joining in. I got these from two different sources. I got them from, uh, I believe it was, let's see, it was Critters and More and from Bitty Bugs. So I have stock from two different sources in here. And they are some lovely bumpy isopods. Let's see, I lost lost the chat for a second. Got it back. So, Shane, you grow Hematococcus versus anthin. It does seem to express best in the cuticle. Try to use anthocyanins to see if things will turn purple. It's really hard to get anything to eat enough. Huh, makes sense. That's fascinating, though. I'm, I'm considering trying the astaxanthin with some of my isopods. I've mostly used it on Daphnia. Uh, and it really helps keep the Daphnia going. Reptilia exotics. Species soil. I don't actually have that one. I have very few Cubaris, really. I, I do have some, but I don't have a million. Um, let's... We can look at some more Cubaris, though. What have I shown you so far? Um, I've shown you Nezodilo Archangeli, which is not really a Cubaris anymore, but it's probably not a Nezodilo either, <laughs> as far as we know. There's a lot of Cubaris that aren't really Cubaris, probably. So, got a couple of these over here. Ooh, tripped over box. Too many things. I'm not watching where I'm going. 
Did we get a super chat from Dope Critters? We did. Super chat from Dope Critters. Thank you, Dope Critters. Do you do anything different for the Paraka or do they take time? Um, I feel like they're really prolific, but they just, they can take a little while to settle in. But once they do, uh, they're, they go crazy. And I don't really do anything different. I keep them like any other armadillidium, pretty much. I do have a video, a care guide, on that species that you can check out on YouTube. But uh, it's basically the um, armadillidium care with a decent moisture gradient. And uh, they do fine on, on that, in my experience. So it might just take a while. These are the, the red, um, red tigers. I love the colors of the red tigers. It's really hard to beat the colors of the red tigers. They, they don't tend to like the choya very much. They really get a kick out of this stuff. The flat pieces of cork bark. And you can see there's some babies on there. Quite a few babies, in fact. But they run. I would say I need to make a care video of these guys. Um, the main drawback of these is that they just have a crazy um, flight response. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're good eaters from what I can tell um, and they go through the substrate and produce a lot of frass so I think um, Andrew yeah I, I think I can say that's true and you can see there's a lot of babies there uh, but yeah they're just they're super afraid or I don't know if I want to say afraid but they they have a flea response a flight response that is m very pronounced more so than many isopods you notice when I just lifted the the height of the paraki, they were just eh, milling around and uh, whatever. But these, despite their, their gorgeous appearance, they just, they're always running. So I'm going to put these these guys down um, right here they do love that flat cork and they're gorgeous don't you think I mean I, I love the color okay we'll put these down and open up this one see if you can figure out which species is in this bin can uh, drill down a little bit closer to it. Sorry, I apologize for the wiggling as I adjust. Oh, it's like we had a little bit of die-off in this bin. That's weird. That's not something I generally have to concern myself with in this bin. Uh, there's lots of funny live ones too. But the pandas... do like the pandas. Let's see what we have under here. Probably going to be loads of them. Yep, oh, pretty good numbers of pandas right there. So someone was asking about dwarf whites. Peepaw, peepaw. Using dwarf whites for my arachnids. I have more than I need now. How can I control their growth? That can be tricky with uh, dwarf whites because with parthenogenesis going on, basically you control their growth uh, by availability of resources, and there's not a lot they need, so it's kind of difficult to do. But I would say um, some things to think about. One, um, if you are worried about them overpopulating a specific bin, that's one thing. And if you're just thinking, oh, I have plenty of them and I don't need more, um, that's something else. You could look into getting something that will eat them, and there's just a number of things that will. Um, for example, dart frogs. You can always put excess into a dart frog enclosure, and they will help clear them out. They they will eat them. They won't eat all of them, but they'll eat uh, a lot of them. So that's that's an option. Could be an option for you if you're interested in the idea of doing dart frogs. Uh, those aren't going to focus, are they? That piece of wood is not going to focus. They've eaten most of that away.
So Izzy, pandas are not too bad for a beginner. I think they're, they're a pretty easy one. Um, they breed really well. So if you're looking at getting uh, uh, into the Cubaris group, then pandas, not a bad choice. It really isn't. Because um, they're, they're amazing as far as being prolific and, and not too difficult to do. Let's take a look here. This is, let's see if anybody can guess this species just by looking. We were talking about coloration and how coloration can be affected by food items. Oh, Karsten, yeah, the Hoffman's egg eye. Um, I've noticed especially the black, Hoffman's egg eye black, which may not actually be Hoffman's egg eye, are really bold, and I have those in the display enclosure. So these look a lot like Glacier. This is actually Armadillidium nasatum, white out. And you can see some coloration in them, but the coloration uh, has to do with the food that they eat. They don't actually have any pigment of their own, but I do give them food with uh, carotenoids in it and so on, so you get sort of this pale orange color. So it looks like 503 was the first to say Nazatum Whiteout. Oh, dope critters, we got another um, super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, dope critters is saying, do you have a Werneri? My culture seems to be purplish. Are they supposed to be that color? They're supposed to be as dark as a clue guy clowns. Well, let's take a look at them. I have two different cultures of two different color variants of Armadillidium Werneri. So let me grab those. One of them is actually right here on my MicroZoo shelf, right here. Okay. And then the other one is over here somewhere. Fairly new culture, this one that I'm about to grab. Just need to find it. There it is. Okay. Here we go. These are, this is Werneri, uh, the wild type. Here is one right there. If I can focus on it. Like I mentioned, this is a fairly new culture um, from two different sources. So uh, one is from Colony and Culture was local to me and the other was from another local um, anonymous owner who gave me their cultures uh, all their isopod cultures in fact and there's a couple of them right there you get an idea of what they look like you can see there's really two different shades there hopefully that helps one of them sort of a darker color and one is mm, almost a browny sort of color one's almost a gray I would say. So that's what those look like. I see we've got a couple more um, super chats. One we've got from Random T. Do you have any albino millipedes? Unfortunately, I don't. I do have millipedes, but not um, albinos. And Karsten, thank you. Hoffman's egg, I do rule. And I appreciate that, uh, that vote of confidence about the channel. That's awesome. And the super chats. So. Let's take a peek here. These are Armadillidium Werneri orange. These are probably my favorite of the of the species. I, I haven't seen the silvers yet, but just look at that. Feast your eyes upon the orange and white spotted beauties. Oh, the beetle guy, you need to do the Clint thing when you get a super chat. I need to get a button that says, super chat! I don't know if I can do it as well as that, but. <laughs> oh, these guys? Um, I don't actually have a permit to ship these, uh, which is unfortunate because they're gorgeous and they're actually breeding pretty well for me. They're, it's a younger culture, but um, this isn't even, you know, this culture hasn't been going for super long, and it's from a couple of different sources. Art of Darts and uh, Closer's Gecko Family 
um, both gave me some initial stock and it's it's doing really well the culture has been growing but I can't ship them and look this is what I like to see with springtails look at those springtails doing really well in that culture So this springtail species loot, this is Sinella curvicetta, which may or may not be mis misidentified, but it's the species widely known as Sinella curvicetta in the hobby. Um, I don't like to use the terms uh, tropical and temperate, not because I want to be snobby about it or anything, but because they're, so, they're used so interchangeably for so many different species of... Well, at least the species Fulsomia candida and Sinella curvicetta get... Uh, interchangeably identified as tropical and, and temperate springtails, so that's why I don't want to use, um, that's why I don't like to use that term, because it really confuses people. Uh, understandably, it confuses me too, because people are always saying, well, I've got tropical springtails, and I've got temperate springtails, and they end up, they're the same species, well, you know, we're having problems here with that. So these, this, this is, they're eating the jams chow, my uh, party mix here. Just wanted to I'll let you catch those for a second. They're pretty excited about that food. We love the party mix. What are we going to check out now? Um, let's look at the Hoffman's Egg Eye Black. I think they would like some too. And we were just talking about Hoffman's Egg Eye, and though these might not actually be Hoffman's Egg Eye, some people were saying in a recent stream that their thought. To possibly be a, a locality of Sevilla or something. Porcelio um, species Sevilla. And who knows. But I do love the Porcelio Hoffman's Egg Eye Black. And I think it would be fun to give them some of this jams chow. See how they do on that. They'll probably go for it. They tend to have a very strong feeding response as well. Stronger than the nominate form of Porcelio uh, Hoffman's Egg Eye in my experience. I do have both and I enjoy both. Let's see what we got here. Let's see what let's see what happens. Oh that's we're getting some overexposure on that that white piece of uh, shell. I'm gonna have to play around with the camera for a minute but I'm gonna give them a nice robust scoop because I know they're really likely to go for it. And see if I can focus in there. I've got stuff in the way. There's a medicine ball on the floor right there because this is also my workout room. This was my critter room. That's a little bit better, huh? There we go. And we've got the first individual coming to get some food. A young juvenile. Interesting when that happens, huh? All right, I'm going to come back and poke into the chat and see as we watch these guys hopefully uh, have a frenzy on the, the food here. Oh, look at this. We're getting a, we're getting a nice little feeding frenzy. I, I bet we're going to get a lot of them going really fast. And they don't seem to mind the light. They really don't seem to mind the light much, which I think is, is different over, from a lot of isopods. Oh, Don Gallagher, Jastroy. Jastroy's hard to beat. One of my favorites. If, if those of you who follow my Instagram have seen uh, this, in this past week I posted something I have two um, display enclosures at work with isopods in them. One of them with Jestray, one of them with uh, Porcelo Leva's rainbow mix. And I showed a clip of my Jestray munching on food and then my Levis and it was night and day. They're so different. <laughs> because the Porcelo Leva's rainbow mix was in a frenzy. They were just jumping, milling all over each other. And then the uh, Jestray were eating and they were out in the open and, and whatnot, but they were very sedate about it. And it's fun to have that contrast. Between the different species. Now these remind me a little pigs around a trough or something. <laughs> it's fun. 
which makes sense because porcello is a diminutive of the Latin word for pig, so it really makes sense. You know, Italian is closely related to Latin, of course, a close descendant of, of Latin, and to say little pig, you say porcellino. There's only uh, really one letter difference, and the pronunciation is a little bit different. And in Latin, of course, the original Latin would be porcellio, um, porcellio, not porcellio, but that's what people say these days. Yeah, we are, we are getting some color variation in there, aren't we? It's kind of fun. Yep. Um, one question that I wanted to answer, and this was from a from a patron. So um, let me get. Oh man, I, I really made a mess of that, didn't I? Okay, there we go. I, I was trying to get to my phone, and so I can look at the question. This question is from Killian. Okay, and the question says, I've been looking into the various substrate mixes people DIY at home, and I'm curious why some work better for others that raise the same species. I'm sure it has something to do with their personal environment, such as the room the colonies are in, the regional location they reside in, as well as perhaps what that individual colony have been raised and bred on such a substrate and supplemental nutrition. Guess what I'm asking is, have you found any correlations between environment or the individual colony's background and what substrate mixes or ratios they most prefer to breed more prolifically or what they eat more voraciously. Well, I think a lot of things can play into that. And I think uh, you hit the nail on the head when you said um, some of these substrate, uh, the success that you might have with a given substrate might not have to do with substrate. Uh, there are so many other variables when it comes to um, raising isopods. Substrate's an important one for sure. But there could be other factors that are influencing it. So a similar substrate, um, but with other factors, of course, you, you can't control for those other factors necessarily, and so you're not sure what is going on there and what might be affecting the um, success rate or the prolific nature of the ice pods, that kind of thing. But I would also say that um, it's probably, besides those factors, the substrate itself, the exact same recipe can vary in the beneficial nature of it based on how microbiologically active it is, what state of decomposition it is in, um, that kind of thing as well. Because if you have, for example, um, soaked oak pellets that have been turned into flake soil, then the ingredients aren't varying much. I mean, you're going to add a few ingredients to the, um, the soaked oak pellets, like wheat bran or flour or some sugar or some apple cider vinegar, some molasses, different things that different people add to get it to, to ferment in different proportions. But what is essentially soaked oak pellets that has become flake soil is no longer nutritionally similar at all to the just freshly soaked oak pellets. There's going to be a lot of nutritional differences. One example is that there's going to be a lot of lactic acid in the uh, flake soil. And that's one of the nutrients that um, it can be really beneficial for ice pods and millipedes, that kind of thing, beetle larvae. And so state of decomposition can make a big difference and the microbiological activity too. If you give isopods sterile, essentially sterile substrate, as opposed to giving them substrate that's had uh, a chance for bacteria to do things like uh, decompose it partially and produce things like uh, lactic acid, which is, you know, flake soil is flake soil because of microbiological activity uh, and certain ingredients to help kickstart that fermentation process, then you're going to get a substantially different product nutritionally. And uh, isopods benefit very much from the bacteria that grow in and on what they eat nutritionally. They're, they're going after the bacteria, they're digesting those bacteria, they're gaining nutrition directly from those bacteria. So I hope that makes a difference. Uh, I hope the difference between those two states is clear and that that answers your question that you posted here on patreon um, i appreciate the question and let me know if you need a follow-up answer on that but that's uh that's what i would say those are probably the most important factors that come to play all right so Yotaro, how many languages do you speak that's a trick question because it depends on how well? <laughs> um, 
because I speak some languages reasonably well, like English, um, like Italian. I, I speak those both quite well. Um, and then I have varying levels of proficiency in other languages. Um, my Spanish isn't bad. Um, I have some basic conversational Portuguese, and there are languages that I read. Right now, for example, I'm reading, I'm learning to read Maori. I'm a beginner, but I'm learning to read Maori. Uh, and I can read Islam fairly well, and let's see, I can read French decently, I don't speak it very well, uh, and I've studied a lot of other languages and understand little bits and pieces and lots of others, but uh, yeah, definitely English and Italian are my best languages. So Tennyson, Porcelio Levis Orange is actually Porcelio C.F. Levis Orange now. That's awesome. Actually, it probably should be uh, a different species. So it's kind of cool that they're doing that. Of course, I'm not sure what that's going to do with permitting, but um, we'll see. But it's good that they're starting to figure out the taxonomy of things. So the shell that I'm using to feed these guys is just a uh, scallop shell I bought on Amazon. I bought a bottle of them. Here, let me show you. I bought this bottle that was, it still has a few in it. It was stacked full. There were over a hundred in there, I think. Um, it was just a few bucks. So that's what I like to use um, for one of the feeding tray options. Um, and Frank, yes. There's a lot of frass in here. It is about time to change the substrate. I'm just checking it out. And yeah, it has been too long. It has been too long. I try for the three to six months. This has gone longer than that. So um, it's time to change the substrate on these guys for sure. And yes, adding a bit of frass to the new bit is good for microbiological uh, activity and, and other things. And winter, we are looking at Porcelio Huffmanzegai Black. And yes, Karsten, uh, very true. You understand, you learn one Romance language, and then you have a, a leg up on the others. Okay, so yeah, 503, eight years of French and some Spanish. And you find that there are similarities that do make that a bit easier. Knowing one does make it easier to learn the other. I, I found that especially true with Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. French is a little bit different from those three. And they're all different from each other, of course, but um, French is more different than those three. So yeah, yeah, that is an interesting thing on these black, the black morph. Uh, it does have a much thinner skirt than most uh, Hoffman's at least most individuals do. Not sure if uh, Wally's still here. All right, well, I'm looking at the clock and it is about time to wrap up. I wanna thank everybody for coming. I wanna thank the patrons uh, for their participation. I wanna thank the uh, viewers in general and especially uh, thank the super chatters for today for helping us out. Um, every little bit helps. The, the channel um, relies upon your help to, to succeed. So all of those things and just watching also help. So I appreciate that. I'll answer one more question, and that is for um, Destruction Warehouse. What's your method of removing frass without leaving anybody's behind? I usually take out one-third to one-half of the substrate, put it into another container, sift through it carefully, very carefully, and then uh, leave it for a while, and then go back to it. You can keep a corner moist, something like that. Uh, put food and, and moisture in one corner, and then come back and check it. And you'll find that uh, most isopods after a week or two will have congregated in that corner and you can remove those most easily. And they might take a few weeks as they you find smaller ones that will grow up a little bit and become more noticeable and things like that. But uh, that is the way to do it. So everybody have a great evening or morning or whatever it is where you are and uh, stay tuned for my video on Friday. I am looking forward to posting that and uh, 
Have a good one.